This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 003. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey, what's happening, everyone? Welcome back. I am your co-host, Michael Bug. With me, as always, my co-host, Jonathan Light. How's it going today, Johnny? It's going really well. Enjoying some time off right now. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a beautiful day. It's been a beautiful week out here in Calgary and excited to uh, keep enjoying the weather. Nice. What have you been up to with uh, the little ones? Oh, we've been all over the city and getting out of town. We've been doing some camping. We've been in the province of Saskatchewan over the last month. Uh, yeah, we've been doing quite a bit. Got myself a little bit of a tan, which does not happen sometimes in this province, just depending on what the weather is looking like. Yeah. And then on the flip side, the uh, yeah, we're in the last month before Jack goes into school right away. So we're getting registration set up for hockey, for school. It's happening. Busy times. Busy times. They are. We're, we're a ways away from school with Riley. But um, yeah, so we got another phenomenal guest here today. Just had an amazing conversation. And we actually talked for another hour after we stopped recording the podcast. We all we got carried away. But wow, this what was a, great a good conversation. One. Yeah. Yeah. I think so many people are going to be able to relate with our next guest. Absolutely. So before I uh, introduce her, uh, what do you got for us this week, Johnny, with our quick tip? Okay, the quick tip today. It's a little bit different, uh, and this one's a little bit more personal just to my life space as of late is that um, a lot of projects on the go, whether it's personal life, professional life, and sometimes we end up moving and not realizing that we need to step back at times. And in stepping back, we become more intentional. So for my quick tip today is for the groups out there that may not have looked at different apps, technology that can help you in your intentionality, uh, I want to mention a couple that uh, I've either explored or am in one case going to get back into. And so the apps I'm discussing is Headspace, Calm, and the one that I'm going to be diving deeper into, which is called Waking Up by Sam Harris. A lot of discussion about calming down our internal brains, meditation, and thinking intentionally into what we are doing on a daily basis. So for anybody that wants to go into that same realm, those three apps, two of the three I've spent some time with, and the third waking up, I'm going to be going into more deeply. Um, great apps, a lot of science behind it, and uh, go have a look. Uh, well worthwhile in my view. And again, I'm on my own personal journey that way. When life seems overwhelming, this intentionally forces us to slow down. So that's your quick tip for today. Nice. Yeah, I've heard lots of good things about the Calm app, um, you know, for people looking to, to slow down. Uh, so with us today, our guest is Dr. Melanie Bowden. Melanie is a 2016 Washington State University graduate. She, is, or she has active licenses in Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Maine, and New Hampshire. That was, that's pretty impressive to have licenses in five states. It really um, is. Yeah. She has an amazing TEDx talk uh, called What Being a Veterinarian Really Takes. And that was actually how we first heard of her and when we subsequently uh, reached out. She is currently working as a relief veterinarian. And as we'll get into in our talk, we kind of discussed uh, some of the vulnerability that she needed to display in her TED talk, um, when, when she needed to make a pivot in her career, kind of making vet medicine work for her. Then we dive into 
discussions around training the client and having those really tough conversations, which was a very powerful uh, discussion. I hadn't really heard that anywhere else. And then lastly, we finish up with a little bit of a discussion on kind of veterinary leadership. So without any further ado, Dr. Melanie Bowden. All right, Melanie, it's great to uh, finally have you on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for, for reaching out and having me. I'm excited to be part of this new project. Yeah, we're, we're very excited to have you. I was, I was saying uh, earlier, as soon as I saw your TED Talk, I reached out to Jonathan and was like, wow, this is a guest we need to have on the show. So, True story. True yeah. story. So I do want to start, um, before we start diving into kind of some of the, the veterinary specific stuff, I want to touch on your TED Talk. So for any of the listeners that maybe don't know, Melanie has a brilliant TED Talk that she did on the veterinary industry. And I was just saying to her, I watched it again this morning, and it's just shy of 300,000 views, which is very impressive. But I wanted to touch on the vulnerability that you displayed with that TED Talk, because it was very impressive. So, so how did you muster the courage to go on a, a platform like that and speak your truth? Well, um, it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, in all honesty. Um, I, um, I've done a lot of public speaking growing up um, and throughout my college experience, and I'm an extrovert, so I'm very comfortable in front of big groups and crowds and stuff. And so, you know, I thought that this would be like that. But um, talking about that subject in particular and um, – you know, I, I talk about mental health and suicide and some of, you know, what's happened to some of my friends. And um, I wasn't expecting that to be that difficult because I've talked about it in other situations, but it definitely, um, it was a whole different world up there. I didn't know that your mouth could get that dry. Um, <laughs> believe, <laughs> like, yeah. like you're like, um, um, seriously, <laughs> like who has water? Um, and then I actually had laryngitis for five days afterwards. Um, so oh. Um, it, it took a physical toll on my body doing it, but, um, the, the whole thing came up because I, um, I had some stuff change in my life, uh, in part because of how I was interacting with veterinary medicine and how that was impacting my personal life. Um, and so I kind of lost my normal person that I, uh, would vent with at the end of the day and decompress with and. Um, so I was out with a friend and we were kind of having like, okay, your turn to talk about your bad week, my turn to talk about my bad week. And, uh, he had nothing to do with the veterinary industry. And, um, he like turned to me and he was like, what? Like, he's like, this is what you deal with every day. And I was like, oh yeah, but that wasn't a bad day. It was just like, you know, a typical day. And he was helping do this local TEDx event. So, you know, TEDx, um, talks are community-based ones that are run by, uh, local you know, community leaders. And so he was one of the volunteers helping with it. And he was like, you should, you should do this. Like you should do this as a Ted talk. So it's all, it's all his, his fault, really. His fault. <laughs> but that but this all came around. <laughs> coincidence, then that leads into a story, which then leads into, you know, truth being told to a bigger yeah. audience, which is mm -hmm. amazing. So kudos to you because you could have easily said, no, no, that's not for me and left it. And that would have been just fine. But instead you went on stage. Yeah. Yeah, when I was formulating the talk and because um, you have a speech coach with Ted. Um, and so when I was formulating the talk, I ended up calling and interviewing a lot of the people that are my close veterinary network. So a lot of my friends from my class year, a couple of mentors who are older than me, and just asking them the question too, like, if you had this opportunity and this platform, what would you want people to know? And so the talk is very genuinely me and, and my story, but it's also trying to speak to those universal themes that other veterinarians really wanted to have, you know, shared. And uh, I think that made it stronger and more universal. And um, the reception has been amazing. I've had veterinarians all over the world. Like um, there's a veterinarian this morning that messaged me from Ethiopia that was like on point. This is totally my experience every day. And I have, you know, people in India and New Zealand and, um, Scandinavian countries. And I mean, it's really, um, it's been interesting to learn, uh, you know, and you guys are up in Canada and I'm in the US. So, you know, it's been really interesting to learn how universal this experience is of being veterinarian and how we all really share in the same struggles. Yeah. 
And that's, that, that is what I was so like impressed with when you put yourself out there in it, like so vulnerable, you have no idea the impact and the ripple effect that it will create. And then here you are worldwide, people are reaching out to you. I'm, I'm very curious, what kind of feedback have you got from non veterinarians? Um, that's a very good question. I do get a lot of, um, like, like pre veterinary track individuals, right? Uh, people in high school and, and undergrad that reach out, but I've also had a fair amount of, um, pet owners and I've had, um, as a relief vet, I also go into lots of different, um, practices doing locum work. And, um, so it's kind of funny because now I go in and some practices recognize me and they're like, oh, you're that doctor about it. <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, but they'll tell me these stories of, um, you know, owners who, um, came in, had seen the Ted talk and brought in like a basket of muffins and a thank you card randomly. Um, you know, I've had, um, pet parents reach out to me and say, you know, I had this, what I thought was a bad euthanasia experience, like the veterinarian seemed distracted and all this stuff and watching your Ted talk really made me understand like what was going on in that situation. And I actually called him and apologized. Like I had like reamed him on, you know, Google or whatever. And I called him and I apologized. Um, you know, um, I've had a lot of, like I said, um, people interested in veterinary medicine as a career reach out. And um, it's been a, it's been a mix. Like I have some people that will be, that'll say like, wow, you've really inspired me. Like, I really want to be part of making this profession better. I've had other people come to me being like, Hey, this really made me do a double check. Like, can I send you some questions and talk to you about like how this is going to impact my life, which I think is an important component. Um, cause I do think that like for my friends who, you know, ended up, um, you know, committing suicide, like there was a disconnect for them in terms of their understanding of what this would really be. And then once they got into it, they didn't see any other way out. And um, so I do think it's important that we be honest about what our industry is like so that people entering into it have a realistic expectation of, um, you know, what they're going to face. And I love being veterinarian. I absolutely love my job, but it's taken me time to figure out that balance of what's healthy for me and then feeling comfortable and confident in setting those boundaries and not feeling guilty about it or feeling like yeah. I'm not a good veterinarian for doing so. Um, and so I'm not someone who's like dissuading people saying like, no, 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 don't be a vet. It's awful. Like yeah. I love it. And um, I wouldn't want to do anything else. Um, but I also understand that it's a little bit of a double edged sword sometimes. Wow. There's a lot there. There's, there's <laughs> lots that I want to dive into. Um, the, the one thing you said in there was kind of that, that awareness, right. Of how to make veterinary medicine work for you. And I know you recently pivoted from say more traditional practice into your current role as more of a relief veterinarian. Can you kind of talk about like what, what drove that pivot to make veterinary medicine work for your lifestyle? Sure. Um, so I think I had a very typical path, um, maybe a little bit faster than some other veterinarians because I'm a very ambitious person who like is always steamrolling full ahead. So that's my, part of my personality that I've had to learn to like temper a little bit in veterinary medicine because I tend to overcommit and then, you know, later regret it. Um, <laughs> but um, so I, yeah, when I graduated, I worked for Banfield for a year and then um ended up moving to a mom and pop practice and was an associate there and then became medical director. And, um, I was hoping to purchase the practice and I had this mindset of like ownership mindset of, um, I'm going to step up, right? Like I, if someone else needs to leave early because their kid can't get picked up from school, if uh, Saturday can't be covered, if, you know, whatever, like I'm the leader of this team, I'm going to lead by example. I'm going to step up. I'm going to you know, do these acts of kindness for my team and, you know, hopefully help create a culture where, you know, everybody pitches in and we feel okay about, um, you know, people needing to take time off and, you know, sharing that burden with each other. Um, and it didn't really work out that way. Um, I ended up being kind of abused in that role. Like nobody else started stepping up. <laughs> um, and so That's I ended up working. <laughs> How many, yeah. how many vets in the clinic and how many overall associates sure. and then overall staff members? Yeah. So we had, um, so we had 
four full-time equivalent veterinarians, but there were six veterinarians total that were working. So two of them split a position. Um, And then uh, we had 25 support staff um, at the practice. Um, mm -hmm, Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so I ended up getting burnt out is the long story short. (laughs) Um, And there were also some issues with leadership in the practice and some personality, you know, stuff. And, um, medical director was a new role for them. So I wasn't really sure like where my authority was and, you know, could I make decisions in an area or not? And, um, the, t- the leadership team was set up a little bit more hierarchically as opposed to kind of cooperatively, which I think was part of the problem as well. And, um, so anyways, at the end of the day, like I was miserable, I was working like probably close to 80 hours a week and getting calls on my day off because customers were upset or whatever. Like I just never had any time by myself. And so, um, I got to a point where I was just like, um, well, and then the opportunity to purchase the practice also went away. So, um, I was kind of in this place of like, well, I'm totally willing to sacrifice and do this if I'm going to be owner and get the benefit out of it. But if that's not there, like, why am I killing myself every day to make you successful? And um, so I ended up quitting and walking away. Um, it actually ended up meaning that the deal with the corporate group that was going to buy it fell through um, because I had all the goodwill of the practice. Um, and so that was really hard decision because I also was really good friends with the owner and I didn't want to, you know, tip the boat and disrupt it. But at the same point, I knew that this wasn't a healthy choice for me and I couldn't sign a three-year contract and do what I'm doing, what I was continuing to do um, and be a successful person. So that for me was kind of my like come to Jesus moment, so to speak, was like, <laughs> I was just like at this place where I really couldn't. And I started, um, I started taking a physical toll. Like I was having um, panic attacks and um, I had gastric ulcers and uh, really bad like gastric reflux that was happening. And um, so like I was just not in a healthy place personally putting in this level of effort. Um, and it was really f- funny in retrospect to me that like literally like within two days of not working there anymore I haven't had a single panic attack since (laughs) like I was like wow "Wow." (laughs) that was a really stressful job Um, and is that something you could recognize (laughs) were were you brushing those all those symptoms off or, or signs to something else at that time yeah I mean um it took me kind of two years to realize what was going on. When I first started, I thought that I was having anaphylaxis. Um, so like, because it was also related to GI stuff. So I'd eat and then I'd have like really bad heartburn and it would like, like feel swelling and like my throat and stuff. And I'd be like, Oh no, I'm allergic to whatever I just ate. And so I take a bunch of Benadryl and then, um, I get sleepy and then I feel better. <laughs> and so when I went in and talked to the doctors about it, they're like, well, but Benadryl would also treat your anxiety. So I'm not <laughs> sure about yeah. what's going on. So, um, so yeah, but I did, I ended up in an ER at one point because I was having such bad, well, it was a panic attack. I thought it was anaphylaxis and, um, they were like, here, we're going to give you a Valium. And I was like, you idiot, like Valium's not going to do anything. <laughs> And um, it fixed me. <laughs> and that's See, when I was like, it's science. It's panic attack. <laughs> and I, I think that's so important. Um, it, like in this industry that you were able to recognize, okay, this role is not working for me, but there's so many options. You can pivot. And you said something uh, when we chatted earlier, you said veterinary medicine happens to you or you take charge right? You can't just be a a passenger and let it sweep you along. So, I mean, I commend you for, for kind of the courage to take charge of that pivot roles um, and head towards your relief work. And are you finding, like you've said, physically, you feel much better in this kind of new role in veterinary medicine? Yeah, I think um, I pivoted to relief work because um, I wasn't ready to commit to another full-time position. And I knew I needed to take time and space from that experience to figure out like what worked for me and what didn't and how did I want to relayer the different aspects of my life and um, create some boundaries with veterinary medicine that would be healthier for me. And so um, relief work definitely gave me that opportunity. I also relief all over the country because I was trying to decide where I wanted to live. And so that was the other reason why I didn't want to um, commit to a full-time position. Um, But I've really enjoyed it because I've gotten to meet um, veterinarians in all paths and lines of work. I work at ER clinics. I work in single doll 
soft practices in the middle of nowhere. I've worked, you know, in urban settings and like cat only and exotics and <laughs> I mean, all sorts of different stuff. So that's been fun for me as a doctor to get to see all these different sides of veterinary medicine. And I'm a business geek. So it's fun for me to get into a bunch of different practices and see how we all kind of deal with the same bottlenecks and um, kind of take best practices from each of those places. Um, so I, I have found it definitely healthier and it's given me the space that I needed. And I am now at a point where I'm starting to think about like going back to a full-time position. Cause I do really miss like part of what I love about veterinary medicine is the fact that it is also a family. Um, and I do miss being part of a veterinary team, um, more consistently. And, um, and I miss, um, you know, having, um, having that bond with yeah. the staff members. Um, so I am finally at a place where like, um, I think I've learned enough about myself and how I want to integrate this, that I can start looking for a position that meets that need. That's fantastic. And that's so the norm as well too. You hear from locum veterinarians will, will get on and, and have a locum for a year or two and I'm a locum myself. And then all of a sudden they're gone. What yeah. <laughs> where did they go? And that's it. That's the big piece of a, a locum, a relief vet is not having a family that yeah. you can really, a, a family, you know, in the, in the work yeah. sense to get in together with, because you are that extra person when you're locuming. So kudos for yeah. you for recognizing that as well, too. It's tough. Well, and locum's always going to be here. I think that's the other like great lesson that I learned is, you know, if at any point I end up in a similar situation, I can always go back and do this. Right. So I'm in a position like, I feel like doing this has empowered me to be in a position where I felt like I can take the right job for me and not just any job, um, you know, because I know now that I can do this on my own and, and be, you know, financially successful enough to pay my bills. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think that's the other part of confidence that doing this has given me as well. Oh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so when I'm hearing this and, and this is an area that I, I was aware of, of that, that you need to take care of yourself, you know, set your own boundaries to, to succeed in veterinary medicine. In your TED talk, you also brought in a piece that I really hadn't heard anywhere else about training the clients. So these kind of go hand in hand, right? You need to sort of take care of yourself, but also create the culture of your clinic with the clients. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's seeing these two pieces working together and how you're putting that message out there is pretty powerful. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's part of, for me, when I talk about like you either let veterinary medicine happen to you or you try to proactively be a part of creating the veterinary world you want. Um, a huge part of it is the clientele. So I think one of the, the things that veterinarians don't always recognize in the stressful moments of high tension with clients is that each time they cave, right? So like each time, you know, Mrs. Smith calls you and, you know, braids you on the phone and you're like, fine, 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 just come in um, for this emergency nail trim. Oh, and now she's sneezing, like whatever, right? Um, every That's time you do that, <laughs> you're just teaching her that if she makes a big enough stink, she gets her way. And so each time she calls, she's going to make a bigger stink and she's going to become a worse and worse client for your entire team over time and you're developing this really toxic relationship with her. If you explain, like if you take that one hard moment and say like, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Smith, I understand that, you know, this is a quote unquote emergency for on your end. Here's what we're dealing with today. My, your options are, I have this one available appointment and if it's really important for you to come in today, you make it work or it sounds like, Maybe we could do something for Fluffy to keep her comfortable till tomorrow. And then you can come in tomorrow. You know, like I don't want her in pain and suffering. Like I'd be happy to send home a couple of days worth of pain meds. And then you could come in in a day or two and we'll take a look at the limp. Um, so I think that they're, you know, and then um, I, my experience has been that clients are really grateful that you're trying to address their concern and giving them something that they can do like at home or whatever in the meantime. Um, a lot of times they just want to know, like, it doesn't sound like an emergency, right? <laughs> like, yeah. um, and, and like, and then setting up a successful, like, here's how we can fix this, or here's what, what I can do for you. Um, and just trying to pivot the conversation to that it's not going to work for everybody. 
But in my opinion, and when I was medical director, the clients that weren't amenable to having like a reasonable discussion and a reasonable like time-based plan for figuring it out weren't people I wanted in my clinic long-term anyways, because they were just going to continue to repeat this behavior and abuse my team. And I would, I have fired clients in the past. I fire clients as a relief vet. Um, and my, the hospitals I work for know that I will do that if I think someone's being disrespectful. And um, the, it's, I think it's an important component because um, I'm personally just one of those people, like I, people don't get to treat me like crap. Like I'm, you're, you're paying for my professional opinion um, and for my professional knowledge and um, you don't get to dictate what I do and I'm respectful about it, but that's the mindset that I try to train my clients in. And I have frank conversations with people like that. If things escalate that, you know, I put them in an exam room, make them wait for two minutes so they can cool off. And then I go in and I tell them like, Hey, do you want to see the video of what you just look like in the lobby? <laughs> yeah. Like we're trying to get like, to the are, end game. Are together. you proud? Are you proud of the way you just treated my reception team? Like I've said that to people before and they're like, Oh no, I'm not like, and it's like, okay. So we both want to do what's best for fluffy today. Can you please tell me like where we didn't meet your expectations and how we can move forward? And like, I don't apologize for what happened or anything like that, but um, you know, people need to learn good manners. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is, this is fascinating to me because there's kind of a mantra, right? The, the customer is always right. And then you take that and you throw it in a veterinary clinic where there can be some very high stress situations. Mm -hmm. And I mean, anyone who's practiced veterinary medicine for any amount of time has had those interactions uh, you, you mentioned one uh, with Ollie the cat. And when I listen to that, when the, when the owner shifts the responsibility and says something like, you're going to make me murder my cat, it, I don't, you can't put into words the toll it takes on the veterinarian. So mm -hmm. good for you for sort of speaking out against that and, and taking a stand because that takes a huge emotional toll. And is that something that you're trained to do or you came into or is you something you've always been able to do in terms of stand up for yourself? And also just even in how you described how you discussed uh, inappropriate behavior with your client there, that's not, to me, that's a learned skill. That's not something that the majority of the veterinarians I've worked with or have, have led can do. Yeah, it's definitely a learned skill. Um, so I, when I decided I wanted to become a veterinarian, um, one of the main reasons I'm, I'm not one of those veterinarians, don't shame me for this, but I'm not one of those veterinarians that had a calling. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I chose to become a veterinarian because I mean, I do really love animals, but, um, I also love the concept of being an entrepreneur. I love the challenge of the diagnostic process and the fact that you get to play Dr. House every day. I love the fact that my schedule is never the same within a half an hour. Um, I, and I love the fact that you get to have so many different caps. Like I love working in practices where you really get to be a jack of all trades and work things up and try things. And you have clients that want to partner with you. Like that's what makes me totally nerd out. Um, so for me, when I went to vet school, a huge part of what I also wanted to learn and a huge part of <clears throat> my focus when I went to do externships at practices and tried to get into different, you know, practices was paying attention to all these soft skills. And um, I was very involved in the veterinary business management association, the VBMA um, at WSU. And it's actually part of the reason why I chose to go to WSU was um, it had the number one chapter in the country. And I had made the choice that I didn't want to do an, like a true MBA and a DVM at the same time. Um, and so um, so I was highly involved in that club at school. I think I did like 140 hours of lectures with them during the four years that I was there. Um, if, if I can jump in for a second, sure. majority of Canadians, there is no chapters in Canada, yeah. which yeah. is so unfortunate. What no. is the BBMA for all of our Canadian listeners who sure. likely won't know what that is? Yeah, so um, there is the opportunity um, well, I'm pretty sure there's still the opportunity. There was when I was there because I was the international chapter leader on the national level. But um, so you can develop your own chapters if there are any students out there listening. Um, what VBMA is, is it is a student run organization. Um, it started at UPenn in 2006, I believe. 
Um, <clears throat> and it is an organization that basically creates a business certificate. And so they have um, four pillars of um, finance, communication, personal leadership, um, and organizational leadership. And um, they uh, basically bring in lecturers that speak to these different topics and talk about the business side of veterinary medicine, not necessarily business ownership, but as an associate, the things that you need to know. <laughs> um, so things like contract negotiation, um, how your average client transaction is truly a measure of the success of your medicine and your compliance, um, how to look at these like key performance indicators, not from a like production, you're being greedy kind of way, but from like, how is it a tool of your effectiveness as a doctor? Um, looking at, um, you know, personal finance and debt, like how are you going to manage your student debt? What are the different loan options? How do they play out for you in your lifetime? Um, you know, how do you help affect and create team culture? How do you talk and do conflict mm. you know, resolution with clients? Um, so they, they focus exclusively on that. You never talk about medicine. <laughs> they just talk about those things. Um, so, and it was very, very helpful. I also cultivated mentors through that program that, you know, really helped me. And um, I think the other part of like, that wasn't a learned skill, but just something that I've always been like, um, for me, the things that terrify me are the things that I'm like, I'm going to become an expert at that. And so when there's something unknown in my life, that's always been the way that I approach it. And um, so when I, with conflict with clients, for example, I was, I was terrified as a student. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm, this is going to go horrible. I'm going to have to fire it. Like I was, I, I was terrified of having to fire my first employee. I was like, I don't like conflict. I don't like, you know, ruining people's days and having to have tough conversations. So yes. I read a bunch of books on it, but then I also talked to like two of my favorite vets in school um, who were professors. And one was um, Dr. Lee and she used to work, uh, she's our cardiologist at WCU. She were, used to work in um, New York city at an ER clinic and you know, New York, New York, right? So she's <laughs> dealing with all sorts of crazy people and New Yorkers are loud and they're somewhat rude. And I can say that because Ooh. I've lived there before. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, they're in your face. And so, and she's this like petite little, like, you know, I think maybe she's like five, three, like she's a petite little thing. And I was like, how did you do it, Dr. Lee? Like you had these crazy people. She's like, I had this guy on meth once. Like she's telling me all these crazy stories. And <laughs> she's like, She's like, I literally get up on my tiptoes and I yelled at him. I said, until you, and she's like pointing and like up and like big. And she's like, until you sit down and listen to me, I can't help your pet and it's going to die. <laughs> and, she's like, and he goes, and he sat down and he listened. <laughs> and I was like, what? And then she taught me about the timeout thing as well. She's like, and then I left him in there for five minutes. She's like, it's really hard to stay angry in a complete vacuum for five minutes. Like, um, so yeah, I mean, talking to other vets and seeing how they handle it and then figuring out what was comfortable for me and right for oh, me. Good. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is one of my areas of interest is all of these soft skills. And so I read a lot of books on it and I listen to a lot of podcasts and it's just, wow. this is leadership is something I'm really interested in. <laughs> wow. I was taking notes there. That, <laughs> that is so impressive. Uh, the, the things that terrify you is what you step into. And I have a mentor that has a saying, something to the effect of, in life, if you do what is difficult, life will be easy. So it's by stepping into these difficult conversations over time, you create a, like an easier culture to work in. That's impressive. And I mean, easier said than done after I have 10 years clinical experience. Those hard conversations are hard. Yeah, so. they are. But I'd rather have them one time and then figure out, like, are you going to be a long-term client or not? Um, then have to have, like, almost just as, like, I would say, like, 80% the intensity 10, 15 times, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I mean, the, the tough con like, it's a tough conversation anytime a client calls in and is upset, right? And it's a domino effect because they beat up your receptionist first to talk to a technician, and then they beat up your technician to talk to you, um, and then they beat you up. So, um, you know, there's way more collateral damage. Um, and that's one of the things that I always tell, like as a team leader and then as a relief vet, I always tell my support staff that I'm like, I don't want to step on anybody's toes and, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, create waves. I said, but if people are upset and they're 
you know, being irate, don't take it. Like you're like, they're not going to be happy until they talk to someone in a white coat. So um, stop the conversation, put them in a room and I'll talk to them. You don't need to ask me, you know, it's not your job to protect me. It's not your job to, you know, create a buffer. I'm not hiding behind you. Like if someone even seems remotely upset, I want to talk to them and I want to talk to them before it escalates. So um, that's just, that's, that's the way I choose to do it. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. So kind of bringing all of your sort of business skills and soft skills together, if, if we had the crystal ball going out forward five years, 10 years, what is, what is veterinary leadership moving forward look like? you know, to, to foster that, those great clinics with that sort of family culture? Yeah, that's a very big question. I know, <laughs> just putting you on the spot. Um, <clears throat> my hope. Um, I think it's a really exciting time to be a young associate veterinarian. I'm five years out of practice. So I'm at a place where now medically, um, I feel pretty confident in my day to day. Like I kind of understand how to work things up. I feel pretty comfortable in my medicine. Um, and so I'm kind of looking for like, where, where do I want to spend, you know, the next 10 years maybe of my career and how do I want my career to grow and develop and what opportunities do I want to invest in? And the thing that I find really exciting and hard to narrow down (laughs) is is there are so many different ways to get involved in veterinary leadership these days. Um, So, I mean, it used to just be like you're an associate or you're a practice owner or like maybe you're a sales rep for Purina or, you know, like there just weren't like a ton of options. Um, But now you can be, you know, a medical director or a team lead or, um, you know, regional director or, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, smaller startup companies happening on a local level, one here in Maine called Rare Breed, um, you know, and they're, they're looking for a wellness director. They're starting a wellness part of their corporate group. And I was like, ooh, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, there's all these different places that you can plug in your passion um, and figure out how you want to grow and still be able to keep a toe in clinics. Um, and that's, for me, part of what I'm trying to think about too with relief is like, you know, if I have a job that allows me to have a little bit extra time, like I could still relief in clinics two days a week, but then have my main job, maybe not be in clinics or vice versa. Um, so I think that's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to in the next decade of veterinary medicine is I think there can be a lot of creativity around career development and how you choose to engage um, so that you're still passionate every day you're on the floor, but then an, I'm also able to help lift others up in the industry around me too and support them. So I don't know exactly what that looks like, but, um, but that would be my, my goal would be to, you know, be fresh and fully present for my patients when I'm there. Um, but have another aspect of my career that, you know, helps move the profession forward and helps, um, support other veterinarians and, you know, being able to figure out their fit and to create, you know, healthier boundaries for themselves. So. I think you just nailed it. I think, I think you, you just said it right there. There's so many opportunities and you get to choose and pick depending on what culture you fit into, depending on what that looks like to you at the time. And, and you are being proactive in making it happen as opposed to letting it happen, which, you know, you described earlier. So I think you're on your way that way. And in veterinary medicine these days, it is completely possible to do what you're describing. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And I think it's going to have to like morph, um, especially as, I mean, the face of veterinary medicine is changing so dramatically, you know, like just having, um, you know, I think when I was in my senior year of school was when we hit like in the United States, 50, 50 with female, male veterinarians in practice. Um, so I, I think, you know, and I think that the way that women engage in work is a little different sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes than the way that men have engaged in the work traditionally. And, um, and so there are, there are more, in my experience, there are more women who are my peers that want to work <clears throat> three days a week or s- do a split, split job, um, you know, so that they can balance family and work and other stuff. And so I think veterinary medicine is going to have to learn how to be more flexible. I think that <clears throat> my generation is super willing to work hard. And when we're at the clinic, be all about the clinic. And that's what I see you know, day in and day out from all of my colleagues and is that like when they're there, they're a doctor and they're not doing other stuff, you know, like it's, 
they're a hundred percent about, you know, this day and, and helping these pets and staying late to do phone calls. But I think that my generation also then wants to say, well, when I'm away from the clinic, I'm not a vet. Like it's my secret identity. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, you know, it's my superhero cape. I just put it on for work. And then when I'm at home, <laughs> <laughs> that's the conversation we have at, at conferences and such is what do you tell people when you're on a plane? What do you do for a living? And oftentimes you don't want to say veterinarian because of the, that's the secret sauce behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah, you that you down. Sometimes of the hour long discussion on the dogs. I've just said yeah. that on the podcast, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, Melanie. Wow. This is, this is amazing. Um, I mean, you, you definitely are having an impact um, and it's just getting started, you know, with, with, with your various talks and the platforms you are, even your mission statement. When I go to your vacation vet website, everything is aligned with moving the profession forward. So I think it's these conversations and, and people like you that are going to keep making that difference and, and get us wh wherever we need to go. So uh, thank you. I mean, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we're going we're gonna to move into our, our impact round here, uh, which is a series of questions. Uh, we're just going to kind of fire them off and you can answer quickly or you can go on a tangent, whatever you would like. So right. first question, are you a cat or a dog person? Oh, I'm a dog person. Dog person. <laughs> True if, it can't, if it can't hike with me, it's not going to be in my house. <laughs> I have seen videos of cats hiking, like one cat one time, but... There's a very special one right around the Banff area that I think has like 600,000 followers now on Instagram. Oh, I'm going to have to find that. <laughs> That's a cool Maybe it'll change my opinion. <laughs> yeah. uh, true or false? I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a kid. True-ish. <laughs> True-ish? Okay. True-ish. Like I said, I'm not a person with a calling, but it was the very first profession I ever said I wanted to be. Nice. How would your friends describe what you do for a living? Uh, I've heard it described many ways. Um, mostly people describe it as orchestrating a crazy circus with animals. That's, that's like what my mom that. calls it. What is your favorite hobby? Oh, I'm an avid backpacker. Backpack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what in short this trips, world like two two three day short trips or week long so right now it's been like two to five days but um my goal in the next year is to do both the john muir trail which is 192 miles and would be like three to four weeks and then um, the coho trail which is in new hampshire and um, that one's 197 so we're working our way up <laughs> wow that's yeah that's serious backpacking <laughs> Mm -hmm. what in this world are you most grateful for? I'm just grateful. I get to wake up every day and be a part of it all. Like, um, yeah, like I just, I really enjoy all of it. Like the ups and the downs and life itself is just fulfilling and it's always surprising. And I'm just grateful that I'm still here and get to love the people I love and be a part of it. And, connect and learn and grow. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> well said. Okay. We got, we got one more question for you. Uh, before we get to that again, thank you so much um, for your time and coming on and sharing with us. If any of the listeners want to get a hold of you, where, where can they find you? Um, so I hang out a lot on Instagram. So um, it's at vacation vet uh, on Instagram and then um, Facebook as well. And then I do have a website, drmelaniebowden.com um, where they can get reach out as well. So. Excellent. And we'll, uh, we'll throw some links around the video. Yeah. All righty. Uh, so final word goes to you. What message do you want to leave for the veterinary community? Um, I think like my biggest passion is for people to know that um, you're not alone in this, um, that veterinary medicine is challenging um, and often it can feel very isolating when you're working in your individual practice but reach out because everybody faces the same challenges you do and um, I think that just as every other thing in veterinary medicine we'll get through this together 
Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.